Good morning. So we're ready to start the first session. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing two extraordinary women from Egypt. Um, my name is Peter Lom. I'm a Czech-Canadian documentary filmmaker, and I specialize in human rights films. I've had the privilege from working with a production company out of Norway for many years now, Pariah Film, and with the support of the, um, the Frit Ward. I made a film about injustice in the uh, aftermath of the Egyptian revolution last year, um, and so that's why I'm introducing this panel today. But just before we start, I just wanted to say a uh, very brief introduction. Yesterday was so inspiring that I couldn't sleep last night. Um, I used to think that, it made me think so much about the power of creativity, which I always think is somehow, in some way, really fragile. Um, when I'm trying to do creative things, I know it's so important to try to listen to the voice inside me. I used to be an academic. It took me 35 years to listen to the voice, which was saying, quit. <laughs> so, so now I do. But um, from yesterday, I I've, I've, I've just want to say so th thank you so much to all my colleagues here because you've really given me such tremendous strength from yesterday. And I wanted to just start the morning by reading you a... <laughs> just to share with you a, a short poem that I read. My partner pointed out to me, we were on the plane coming to Norway. Um, it's by a, a Vietnamese poet a dissident poet named Nguyen Chi Tien. I don't know, I'd never heard of him. And he just passed away. He was a dissident poet under the communist, uh, in communist Vietnam. And, this is, and he was, of course, persecuted. And this is what he wrote. So very, two very short poems. They exiled me to the heart of the jungle, wishing to fertilize the manioc with my remains. I turned into an expert hunter and came out full of snake wisdom and rhino fierceness. They sank me into the ocean, wishing me to remain in the depths. I became a deep-sea diver and came up covered with scintillating pearls. So that's what I want to share with you. So, uh, so I have two scintillating pearls to introduce you to this morning. The first is Shirin Amer. Shirin, please come to the stage. Shirin is, uh, I think I will have to have her introduce my, her, my, herself, but she told me when we were discussing yesterday, she said, I'm the only woman in Egypt who screams. <laughs> she started uh, the only, first and only all woman band in Egypt, and uh, she's going to have two different numbers to perform for us today. Uh, at the same time, we also wanted to mix it up a little bit to introduce our second guest, so they're on stage together because they've also become best friends here. And uh, so we run it a little bit more like a dialogue. So allow me to in introduce as well at the same time, Sondo Shabayek, 27, also from Egypt. <laughs> and you'll learn well enough that Sondos is one of the bravest women I've ever met. I had the privilege of meeting Sondos two years ago when we started working on a film together with her. And she used to be a journalist, uh, to become activist and now a theater maker, uh, an actress, uh, and she's had the extraordinary courage that we'll show when we introduce her later, to already be protesting and putting on YouTube tube, uh, against the Mubarak regime before the revolution starts, well before this revolution started, so just an extraordinary young woman. So, uh, but in our program order, we're going to start together with Shireen. So, uh, Shireen, uh, before we show the four-minute clip from your your breakout hit, Microphone. Can you tell us a little bit about the film and then before we'll show the clip, yeah. Um, the film um, has been screened in 2010. It was 11. 11. It was on the day of the, revo the revolution. It was by coincidence. And it talks about uh, the underground scene um, in art and music in Alexandria. Uh, and it focuses uh, about all the problems that the musicians and the artists they might face uh, in the city and the country with the government and the society and everything. Great. And it, you see that uh, it's a little bit different in style from what you're going to perform for us in a little bit. Yeah. But uh, maybe we can just play the clip. What are you doing, Salah? Yes. Tell me what you're doing. You're doing Arabic. Yes, you're doing Arabic. No, you're doing Arabic. What's the problem? There's no problem. 
لا انتوا كان عندكم اغنيه سفر بعيد حاجه لا بتعرفوا مكان مكان I'd like to explain a little bit about the movie. Um, we had to not to show our faces in the movie. Uh, if, you, if you're gonna watch it, it's called Microphone. And the reason behind it, it's because um, our parents uh, and the band, they wouldn't let us to um, show our faces because of the restrictions of the society. And that brings us back to the idea why it's an all girls band. Uh, I am not really, uh, like, I do support women in art and music, but I'm not really like a feminist, like hardcore feminist. I wouldn't want to like separate guys from women, and you know what I mean. So I, I had passion for music ever since I was six, and by the age of 16, I wanted to start my heavy metal band. But I faced a, a big, big problems with my family, that they never wanted me to play music, and especially with guys. So I was... I didn't know what to do. I had to compromise a little bit with my family, and me and my friend, the violinist. So we had to compromise, and we had to get a female drummer and a female bassist. And even though we weren't really, really happy with the output, but we, we just wanted to play music, and we just had to do it this, their, in their way. But by, the, by 2009, we managed to actually beat this. We had uh, to perform in Sweden 
And we had to stand up and say, no, we, we just want to do the music the way we, we're doing. We want, we want to feel it, we want to let it out, and we want to present it the way we want to present. We just don't want to pick a drummer just because she's a girl. That wouldn't make any sense. So we actually managed to do this and get the drummer that we've always wanted to play with and to travel and make our concert and to break this cycle. And this was something, and the movie is another thing because we had to hide from our family that we, we actually made a movie. <laughs> so we had to hide our faces because my mom and her mom, they just know that we, we're going to be in a movie that is going to be screened, but the rest of our families didn't really know, which was a big disaster. And uh, all our scenes in the movie are out of focus. And we, we told the director that it, we don't really want to appear in the movie, but he insisted since we're, we've done something in our music and he really liked our songs and he really wanted to show this to the society. So we hide it, but of course it came out because my sister, she, she saw um, a part of our performance online and it was a big, big disaster uh, and a big problem in our family. But uh, out of curiosity, she had to watch the movie. And when she watched the movie, she understood our problems in the scene and what, what the society is doing to us and what, what the family is doing to us. And this is when all just made, it was so clear to our parents and our family and even our extended family that what they're doing is oppressing and it doesn't make any sense. We're just two girls and we want to make music and that's it, it's not a crime. So the movie means so much to us because it, it, it opened um, the eyes of our parents and our family that we're not doing anything wrong and that we have the right to express ourselves and to perform and to share our music with the people around us and the whole world. So after this movie, things are, they've gone really, really good with our parents and family. So yeah. So you want to do your song? So now you'll sing, you sing a song first. That's uh, You're on tour now. You've been uh, opening for ZZ Top and playing with Motorhead and now in, live in Oslo. Yeah? Bye. 
your knees on the floor Pray and be careful what you wish for going to stay in the background for the rest of the session. <laughs> Come on, I'm gonna... uh, that's some wake-up call. <laughs> uh, we have a couple more minutes still to talk about a few things, so can you tell us uh, what, what you want to talk about, what it's like to be a woman performing now in Egypt? Um, it's, it's kind of hard because the culture of the society itself, it, it has, it's very discriminative. I mean, they're, they're, you'd, you'd find problems at work and in the street just because you're a woman. There, are, there is this disc discriminative attitude. So <laughs> um, the metal scene itself, it is very discriminative. So being uh, a girl that sings and, and playing in a band that has two females, it's really, it's really irritative for them. They hardly accept us. They, they just find it not really comfortable that we're doing stuff, that we're going on tours, and they always blame it because we're girls. If we're, if we're playing with Motorhead, it's because we're girls, as if I go naked on stage or something, which I, I, I find it very hard to understand. Or you have this attitude that, ah, oh, you're, you're doing this just because you're a girl, or you have the other attitude of treating like a, a handicap, like, oh, you can sing, bravo. It's like, oh, come on, you guys, <laughs> I'm a human being, I shouldn't be treated differently. So it's, it's always, on a monthly basis, I have this argument with a fellow musician who plays in a band, and it just pisses me off sometimes, but if they, if they really think that whatever we accomplish, it's because of our gender, then they could wear, like, I don't know, wigs, and show, them what, show me what they got, Yanni. <laughs> uh, and what else? We talked about before, you told me yesterday, uh, how, some people think your metal music is satanic. Yeah. Uh, it's another problem that we're facing. Um, this is, you're, we're speaking about a, a society that has a lot, large number of, of ignorance and, and relies on, on religion even though they, they don't practice it, but it's part of our tradition, the religion background. Anything that is new, that it, they, they object on it, and we've been facing so many uh, problems and they accuse that our music or like metal music in gen generally is related to satanism. So I I'd be sitting in my office and the office boy comes in with a, a paper from the newspaper with my photo on it and my name. The satanic has been blah, 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 I don't know what. So the office boy comes in, oh my God, do you really worship devil? So I go like, what, what, what is this? Where did you get this from? Isn't this your photo? And then I found my photo in the newspaper where everybody's saying that the band is playing satanic music and it, you'd find the religious um, channels, they make fake documentaries where, I don't know from where did, do they get the fake information that we like slaughter uh, cats by the end of 
the performances. <laughs> and this is not just my band, it's, it's the whole scene. Like any band that sings, that has the harsh vocals of the death metal vocals that I do, this is a satanic and this is a ritual and if we had band like this on stage, oh my God, we're doing rituals and it's very messy. And currently I'm filing a case against the newspaper that has been, had, had said this about us and um, the lawyer who filed the case against the venue that we performed at is actually the lawyer of um, the Muslim Brotherhood Party, uh, Freedom, of, Freedom of Justice? I don't know the name in English. Freedom and, Freedom and Justice? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Freedom and Justice. This is the party uh, related to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. The guy, he's the lawyer of the, of the party. He's the one who filed the case. And it's a little bit messy, but I think the... Um, both the police, uh, the police and, um, and the media and the army, they are on our side. Not, just be, no, not because they like us, it's because they hate the Muslim Brotherhood, so <laughs> we're getting this. <laughs> and uh, I think we're running out of time, but I think we have one time for one last question. Can you tell us uh, how you're able to perform in Egypt or what kind of restrictions you face to perform there? We're almost banned from, from performing anywhere but the cultural wheel, the culture of Sawi. But even though we perform there, and we thank him, of course, for letting us play, <laughs> but he has to check our lyrics, and he has to make sure that we're not saying anything explicit. He comes on the stage, and he has to check what I'm wearing, if I'm wearing anything revealing, according to his standards. It's like having my mom <laughs> again. <laughs> but this is the only way we can do it, or else the metal scene is gonna die, like in Alexandria, where I come from my city, the metal scene is dead, because we don't have, Biblioteca, Alexandrina, they banned all the bands from performing there, so the music is dying basically in Alexandria. And if the Sawi doesn't let us play in his venue, then we're, we're dead as well. And Massive Scar Era. Massive Scar Era. We have a short name, Mascara, for it. It's and easier. <laughs> so thank you so much, thank and you. please stay on stage with us so we can keep trying to have Thanks. a dialogue. Thank you, everybody. And I guess I, we just forgot to say too that she read that uh, the only reason you're allowed to perform is because your lyrics are in English. You told us too that if they were, what? you said that the, the only reason the you're lyrics. allowed to perform at this one place is because you sing in English, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, yeah. we have, the government wouldn't really concentrate on what, what we're presenting because it's, it's in English. So we're not going to affect the public point of view. We attract like thousand. Only thousand, that's the maximum metal scene audience in Egypt. So we're not really effective in the society. So they, I think as long as we're cool, we're underground, they wouldn't really concentrate on what we're presenting. Okay. Sondo Shabayek. Hi. Hello. Uh, I think we should uh, just immediately start with this extraordinary footage that you filmed. Maybe you just want to give us a 30 second introduction and then we'll play the clip. Uh, what you're about to see is part of a protest that took place in 2010. Uh, remember, they always link the revolution of Egypt to the death, of, the death and torture of uh, someone who was probably my age or even younger. He's called Khalid Said. This is one of the most important triggers of the revolution. And this was part of the protest when people went out there in front of... They tried to get to the Ministry of Interior to actually protest how he was tortured to death. And what you're about to see is what happened before we actually get to the place of the protest. Well before the revolution. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so Son does had the courage to film things like this and put them on, on the internet well before the revolution. So um, um, she then became, um, well, you should tell us in your own words, one of the, I think the best known activists in Egypt, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not that yeah. much. 
Um, I used to go. I used to work as a as a journalist and editor of a magazine, and I used to gradually go around filming with my flip cam because people would think it's a mobile. They wouldn't think it's a it's a camera, so I can get away with it. And this was one of the things that was filmed. But I have to mention that there were a lot of activists my age, and they were even. I think braver than I am because I always remember myself as a person who used to run away when it gets really serious, when it's when it's like extreme tear gas or gunshots. I'm one of the people who runs, so I don't consider myself like absolutely completely brave as Peter described me. Anyways, um, what happened is that during the 15 days of the revolution, not that it, it has ended, but during the very famous 18 days, I'm sorry, uh, after which Mubarak stepped down and we were on the square day and night. I was there day and night, and, and I realized I was a very passionate journalist. I, was, I always had an extreme passion for journalism, and I believed that the search for the truth and putting it out there to people would change the country and eventually my world. I was such a dreamy girl, but anyways. Um, so what happens that during those 18 days, I realized that there is no such thing as independent objective media. Uh, all the medias, including those that I really respected and admired, I realized were quite politicized. Because being on the square, you had a completely different perspective. Uh, you would see things as they happen, and then the next day, read about the newspapers, and then you'd go like, oh my God, but this is not what happened. And, and it suddenly hit me that if I want to get the truth out there, it's not going to be, during, uh, it's not going to be using journalism or media. This is not going to happen. And at the same time, something, something very extraordinary happened, because on the square, while we were not chanting, for example, or protesting, or carrying sound, funny signs that said, please step down, I need to shave my head, or please step down, I need to change my socks, um, we were telling stories. We were telling stories of what happened on the 28th, during the, when we came face to face with the police forces, we were telling stories of who throw, uh, threw out a stone at a police officer and who carried a tear gas bomb and threw it in the Nile. Um, and after the 18 days, we, again, you'd hear stories being told over and over again. And I found something very beautiful in those stories. Not only did they document the revolution from a completely different perspective, other than the one that is reflected in the media, um, or by the politicians, or by historians. Um, they documented something that's very different. They documented the human experience in the revolution. They reminded us day, day and night of what has happened, of what we were able to accomplish. It was more... You know when they say religion is opium? I found that stories were opium to us. And so I gradually, I don't know how, I just drifted away from journalism and then I I sought refuge in stories. This is what I want to do. The stories would tell you a different type of truth, truth that's more genuine, a truth that no one can mess up with. So I began working on a storytelling project of uh, stories and testimonies from the revolution, uh, which later on got the name Tahrir Monologues. Um, what you're about to see, however, is a project that started years before Tahrir Monologues, but never got the chance to be out to the people because of, again, the censorship and because of the situation, and because we weren't personally brave enough, because I don't want to blame it all on the censorship. The, this is a video um, of a performance called The Bussy Project. This is a performance of stories from women in the community, and it was originally inspired by the American Vagina Monologues. Um, it was basically just stories and testimonies of women, of their experiences with everything related to womanhood. And, of course, it was almost impossible to perform it before the revolution. We started performing in 2006, and we kept, get, we kept getting banned and censored on and off every day, and until it got really at the peak. By 2010, we weren't allowed anywhere, basically. Not even in Saya, not anywhere. Uh, and then after the revolution, we were able to perform again, but for, what you're about to see is just a music video. Um, of the documentation we did of the performance in 2010 that never actually, that we were never actually able to perform. Okay. Bus. Okay. Story, I'll 
على نفسك اكدبي قالوا لي ما تقوليش اكتبي ما تحكيش استوري الفي على نفسك اكدبي خلاص الكبة بطلت very recently because we were trying to uh, prepare for a screening for the monologues uh, in the US and we were told that we should change the name of the project because Bussy is another, w w sounds like Pussy and Pussy is very offensive to the American audience and I'm like but I've been able to keep this name in Egypt so if I can't keep it in the US then I don't know. So anyways I just got informed about this in the morning so I wanted to share it out there. Yeah, they, they were like asking us, it's, you know, it's a little bit offensive and I'm like, okay, the, the entire project is not really, you know, it's, the, the point is not to come here and do that, the point is just to shook, uh, shock the hell out of you, so we're keeping the name. Anyways, the next, the next video you're going to see is a very short, a short trailer of the other project, Tahrir Monologues, which is a collection of stories and testimonies of people from the revolution and the people themselves perform it on stage after a series of workshops and trainings. وانا ممكن احكي عن الثورة؟ انا نزلت التحرير يوم 25 ما شاركتش ما كانش في مكان تهرب فيه الا اذا كنت ناوي تنط في النيل جريت ورا المزارة وفي ايدي المايك يومها سالت نفسي انا نازل ليه؟ ما حسيتش بنفسي غير وانا بجري مع المتظاهرين انا مش خاين للثورة ولا حاجة كنت ان انا جبان جدا بسام ابتسامة عمري في حياتي ما هنساها اهلي امبارح شافوني على قناة الجزيرة وانا بلم الزبالة في النيل روحت يومها وبكيت ساعات والمرة دي فعلا ما كنتش خايف من حاجة قدامي يومها ما كانش شكله دم ما كانش فيه خوف لكن أنا ما كنتش خايفة أنا أول مرة أحس إن أنا ليا لازمة الظابط كان دايس بجزمته على وشي ساعات كنا بنحس بظلم أنا مش جبان ومش هجري مش هجري منكم تاني I do your okay. yeah. Thank so, you. What do we do next? What do we do next? <laughs> okay. Um, I had originally prepared uh, a monologue to say because most of the monologues here are in Arabic. Uh, I had origin originally prepared one, but when I was on stage in the morning while we were preparing, something else came to my mind. So what I'm going to do is that I, I'm going to try and remember the moment again and tell it, but this is not, I did not prepare the text. Uh, but I feel that this is what I need to share at this point. Um, during the revolution, we've always been asked about this moment of fear, this moment when we were able to overcome our fear. Because as we shared stories, we realized that everyone has a moment where he was able to overcome his fear, whether this moment was on Tahrir Square or, on, or back at home as he was watching TV. There was always this moment where he was face-to-face -face with his 
biggest fear ever. And of course, the biggest fear is the fear of death. And it's very, I mean, it's very relative where it happened. So I'm going to try and remember how it happened to me, my moment of fear. This is what I want to share with you here. It was on the 26th of January, not the 25th. And we were protesting in a big street. It's called Ramsey Street in Cairo. I remember that suddenly, as we were chanting, suddenly the police officers attacked, the police officers and policemen attacked from all sides. And then all of a sudden, I'm running with the protesters. I was trying to be very conscious and very cautious at the same time, because I always knew that the most important thing in any protest is the part where you're supposed to run. Your steps have to be steady, fast. You have to have comfortable shoes, comfortable pants in order to run. The worst thing that could happen to you in any protest is that you fall, because you, you will either die underneath the footsteps of the people, or you, or you will be arrested. So that was, to me, the worst thing that could ever happen. So I started running, running, and then a few seconds, I could feel I was losing my feet. I, I was losing control over my feet. And then a few seconds later on, I was on the ground. And I started feeling the footsteps of people all over my body. And then a few seconds, I started feeling I was, I was unable to breathe because they had started already throwing tear gas bombs. And plus, underneath feet, there is no air anyways. And then I thought to myself, I'm unable to breathe, a few seconds, I will faint, and then a few seconds later, I'll be arrested. And I don't know how, but this quickly happened in my head. I thought, is that it? I mean, we're not even the 28th yet. <laughs> Are you going to, that's how it's just going to end? Here, right here, now? And for a few seconds more, this was really hard to accept for me. This was really hard. This is not what I want. This is not what I want to happen. I don't want things to end here. But then all of a sudden, I'm, I came into sudden peace with the idea that yes, I'm at peace for things to end here. Whether I'll faint, whether they arrest me, I don't know. But there was just sudden peace inside me. And then a few seconds later, after this peace. I found my hand holding onto a fence that I had fallen close by to, and then I got up and I went and I went on running again. All I remember is that I was bleeding all over. My pants were all torn, torn into pieces, but I was still running. But I remember that when my eyes were still fixed on that spot where I had fallen down, I remember that I ran like half an hour back to the office and then later on back home. And it was only when I got to bed that I sat down on the floor and started crying. I had remembered the friends I saw getting arrested on the 25th. I had remembered feeling very humiliated. I had remembered seeing people kicked and beaten up just because they were just chanting for Egypt. I remembered I cried so strongly because I felt that something different was happening inside me, that my fear is no longer as big as it was before. I cried so much because I felt that the next time when I go down, this is going to be different. That next time when we start chanting and then they attack us from all sides and we start running, I will run very fast, but this time I will not run away from them. At least this is what I hoped. Thank you. So we're going to run out of time, but uh, so I won't talk. I will just show you a four, five minute, maybe three minute clip of the film I'm working on with, together with my partner, which focuses on Sondos and four other young woman artists. So we're trying to give them a, their voice so it's heard even more strongly. Thank you.
انا بحب الشارع وانا بحب الناس قوي انا عصبيه طيبه انا احيانا بحس انه ان انا شجاعه قوي قوي واحيانا بحس ان انا جبانه جدا 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 انا بحب الجزم بحب الكعب العالي وكنت بلبس كعب عالي بطلت البس كعب عالي الفتره دي يعني عشان مش مريحه قوي للتنقل بس يمكن ارجع تاني فتره لفتره انا ما بحبش ابقى في اماكن مغلقه وقت كتير انا وانا صغيره كنت كنت متخيله انا عايزه ابقى ولد انا عندي ثلاثه اخوات ولاد و كنت متخيلة أنا عايزة أبقى ولد بس دلوقتي أنا مبسوطة إن يعني أنا بنت أنا في بعض الأحيان بتكسف من غير لازمة أنا طموحة أنا انا لسه ما اظنش ان انا عارفه نفسي كفايه فانا تايهه انا انا روح وجسد ونفس بتتحرك ما بين الاثنين انا شويه حاجات شفتها وسمعتها ومكان عشت فيه انا شويه ناس ما اعرفهمش بس غيروا لي حياتي انا 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 ايه اللي انا عايزاه وده اللي دايما بي بيخليني غضبانه طول الوقت وده اللي دايما بيبقى الحافز بالنسبه لي هو ان انا يبقى عندي حريه التعبير عن نفسي يبقى عندي حريه الاختيار ابقى عايشه حياه انا اخترتها بناء على قرارات انا عملتها ما بقاش انا فار تجارب ما بقاش انا يعني ارض في قفص ده ده اللي بيحركني بشكل يومي وده اللي بيحرك كل حاجه انا بعملها في حياتي يعني اعمل مشاريع من خلال المسرح ان انا عايزه اجمع قصص حقيقيه مثلا وانشرها في منكم موقفين بس ما تزعلوش بالحوار مره كنت ماشيه في وقعت 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 العربيه وانا نازل شفيت العربيه وقال لي انا عايزه احط تيت جوه تيت نفسي حاجة تحصل ف... فتأكد ان خلاص اللي حصل السنة اللي فاتت ما مش هيروح على الفاضي وما راحش على الفاضي حتى لو الموضوع هياخد سنين نفسي في ايه تاني حد بيحس ان هو نفسه في حاجات كتير قوي بس اول ما حد بيسأله انت نفسك في ايه بيحس انه ما عندوش اي حاجة يقولها عشان غالبا عشان غالبا عشان ساعات بنندمج قوي في الحياه اليوميه فبننسى احنا عايزين ايه اصلا او بننسى احنا كان نفسنا في ايه او مش مش بنفقد الامل بس بنبطل نحلم او بنبطل يبقى عندنا الافكار الطفوليه اللي كانت عند الناس نفسي ما يبقاش في رقابه Uh, you see it
I'm sorry we're out of time, but thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Shireen. Thank you so much, Sondos. Thank you.